Okay, welcome everyone. I'm Matthew Kipney, the Director of the Refugee Studies Centre, and I'd like to welcome you to the 2020 Barbara Harold Bond Lecture. This is the first time the lecture has been held online, and, and of course that means we cannot see you in person and share this experience in the traditional way, let alone have a drink together afterwards. But this format does have the benefit, I'm pleased to say, of enabling the lecture to reach a much larger audience than normal. This lecture is named after the founder and original director of the Refugee Studies Centre, who passed away in 2018. Barbara Harold Bond was a formidable and courageous advocate, both for refugee-related research and for refugees themselves. Her scholarship laid the foundations for the modern academic field of refugee studies. I'm pleased to say that the centre that Barbara pioneered at Oxford during the 1980s thrives today as the largest and most prolific academic centre on forced migration in the world. This annual lecture series honours Barbara's memory and contributes in a small way to promoting her vision of a more, uh, of a more just world for refugees. Tonight's lecture, the 21st, will be given by Professor Jan Werner Muller of Princeton University. Professor Muller is a scholar of great distinction and no stranger to Oxford. After being a student in Berlin, London, Oxford and Princeton, he became a fellow of All Souls here at Oxford in 1996. In 2003, he moved to a fellowship in European thought at St Anthony's College and in 2005 he left the UK for his present position as a professor of politics at Princeton University. Professor Muller is a renowned intellectual historian and political theorist who has published many books that are widely translated. These include Another Country, German Intellectuals Unification and National Identity, a Dangerous Mind, Carl Schmitt in Post-War European Thought, Memory and Power in Post-War Europe, German Ideologies since 1945, and there is also his highly regarded work of political theory, Constitutional Patriotism, which was published in 2007. But impressive as these achievements are, what really brought, uh, brought him into the orbit of the Refugee Studies Centre was his influential work on populism. Professor Muller's 2016 book, What is Populism? and his many thought pieces in the world's popular press have marked him out as a sage observer of the recent growth of this phenomenon. The spread of diverse forms of populism with their chauvinistic conception of peoplehood and, uh, uh, and hostility to uh, liberal norms and anxieties of foreign influence has had profound implications for refugees and for immigrants. At the very least, migrants has, have served as bete noir to uh, mobilize public fear and thus electoral support. Professor Muller is giving this lecture at a time when populism's most famous contemporary exponent has thankfully been given his marching orders by the US electorate. But who can feel confident that we have seen the back of this kind of anti-immigrant hostility that he represented and which still has many adherents in countries like the Czech Republic, Hungary, Brazil, and even here in the UK. Hence the urgent need for the kind of critical reflection on populism that Professor Muller can provide. Now, before I hand over to our speaker, may I remind you that there will be 30 minutes of questions at the end of this lecture. You can submit questions as soon as the lecture starts via the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and I will read uh, the questions out. Please try to keep your questions short and to the point so that we can get through as many as possible. So without any further ado, let me hand over to Professor Muller to speak on democracy after right-wing populism. Thank you, Matt, 
for this very kind introduction. It's nice to be back at Oxford, whatever the ontological status of being back on Zoom is supposed to be exactly. Above all, let me thank you for having invited me to give the annual um, Barbara Harrell Bond lecture. It's, it's a great honor for me, not least because obviously I'm somewhat of an outsider to refugee studies. And I'm afraid I will not really be commenting or talking about aspects of refugee policy as such. I will, however, employ words which will be all too familiar for those interested in refugee studies. I'll be talking quite a bit about hard borders, except that by those words, I don't mean physical or for that matter, legal fortifications to keep people out. What I'll be mostly talking about is what I conceive of as a kind of hard and important boundary of democratic discourse, a border which right-wing populists habitually tend to cross. To make that thought plausible, I will try to offer you in the first chapter of my lecture tonight, a kind of suggestion of how to best understand the phenomenon of right-wing populism. I will then in a second chapter, say a little bit about the place of this phenomenon in the larger political landscape of the 21st century. And some of what I'll say in that second chapter will perhaps to some of you sound like a somewhat typical, typical way for so-called liberal elites to be in denial about what's really going on, uh, being in denial about right-wing populism now being the dominant or at least very important force in 21st century politics. Bear with me, I will try to relativize these common impressions somewhat before in a third chapter, turning to what I think is a relatively understudied factor in the rise of right-wing populism, where a lot of emphasis has been on policy, a lot of emphasis has been on persons, supposedly charismatic leaders, not all that much emphasis has been on a phenomenon which certainly doesn't determine the rise of right-wing populism, but which can, in my view, facilitate it. And that is what I will call another peculiar employment of familiar words, the critical infrastructure of democracies, by which I mean in particular political parties and professional media. And I will try to show how the decay of that critical infrastructure has in important ways facilitated, again, I say facilitated, not determined, the rise of right-wing populism. So that's a bit of a mouthful. Let's start at the beginning. Let me open my first chapter and simply ask what exactly should we mean by right-wing populism anyway? Conventional wisdom of our day, of course, has it that in general, populists are those who, as the usual phrases go, criticize elites or who are angry at the establishment somehow. When you think about it, it's actually a rather peculiar thought. Up until quite recently, I think any old civics textbook would have told us that keeping an eye on the powerful, even being critical with the powerful is a sign of being a good democratic citizen and is not somehow a pathological, potentially for democracy pernicious phenomenon. And yet, come the early 21st century, we're told day and night that criticizing elites is somehow populism, which somehow, at least in most European contexts, not always in the US, is held to be dangerous for democracy. Clearly things can't be that simple. It's true that populist leaders, populist parties, when they are in opposition, tend to criticize other parties and the government in particular, and in that sense are anti-elitist. But they also, and this for me is crucial, do something else. In one way or another, they tend to suggest that they, 
and only they represent what populists often call the real people or also typically the silent majority. You might say that this in and of itself is not so obviously bad or dangerous. This is not obviously the same as say racism or let's say a fanatical hatred of the European Union. And yet this claiming of a monopoly of representing the people always does have two for democracy detrimental consequences. First and rather obviously, populists tend to say that all other contenders for power are fundamentally illegitimate, which is never just a disagreement in matters of policy or even for that matter in questions of value, all of which is of course completely normal, ideally even productive in the democracy. No, in a certain way, populists immediately make it personal and they make it entirely moral by suggesting that other politicians are simply, to coin a phrase, crooked characters. What the 45th president of the United States did in his first major campaign in 1516, and now again did in his campaign in 2020, in many ways was extreme, but it was not truly exceptional. It is, I submit to you, what all populists tend to do in one form or another. Secondly, and maybe less obviously, populists will also suggest that all those citizens, all those, if you like, among the people themselves who do not share the populists' symbolic understanding of the real people, or for that matter, the silent majority, and who therefore logically, you might say, do not support the populists politically, that with all these citizens, according to populists, you can put into question whether they truly belong to the people in the first place. If you allow me one more Trump quotation, in May 2016, in a speech which otherwise drew little attention, Trump said, and I'm more or less quoting from memory, the most important thing is the unification of the people and all the other people don't mean anything. In other words, the populace defines who the real people are. And even if you happen to hold an American, a British, a German, an Australian, whatever passport, that's not really the question. It's the leader who decides who the real people are. And some are simply going to be excluded on that basis. If you think Trump is old hat, allow me to just give you a quotation or rather a tweet from the recently re-elected Ohio representative Jim Jordan, who observed in, if I remember correctly, in October, Americans love America. They don't want their neighborhoods turning into San Francisco. I hope you can see the point. It's the populist who tells us who the real Americans are and who is not really an American. In other words, populists are not just anti-elitists. In fact, being an anti-elitist is not in and of itself a dangerous thing for democracy and quite possibly, quite often, the opposite is the case. The problematic aspect and the crucial aspect in my view of populism is anti-pluralism. The tendency always to exclude others, pretty obviously at the level of party politics, less obviously, at the level of the people themselves, where some are simply denied standing, are simply told they don't quite belong, or are simply told, and now I can't resist another Trump quotation, to go back to, as he infamously put it, vis-a-vis -vis four female Congresswomen, to go back to their shithole countries. This is, in a nutshell, what I take to be both the characteristic and the particular pernicious element in right-wing populism. Another way of putting the point is to say that the leaders of right-wing populism will have a tendency to reduce all political questions, even all policy questions, to questions of belonging. And that in that sense, they are always, in one form or another, waging a form of culture war, which will divide people into those who belong and those who don't quite belong.
And one of the things we've certainly seen in the past few years is that the strategy of polarizing societies and then telling people that an election is of existential importance can be very successful. We have plenty of evidence now from our colleagues in political science who have shown that some of the more or less direct attacks on democracy as well as checks and balances, judiciary and so on, are well noted by citizens. It's not that everybody is duped or nobody has any sort of sense that maybe democracy is being damaged in certain ways. But the, I hesitate to use the term, but the art of some of these right-wing populist leaders has precisely been to create a situation where people feel, well, the choice is either to stick with my side or to go with somebody who, let's say in economic policy or other matters is good for me, or to face some kind of quasi existential loss or defeat. In other words, the creation of a sort of sense of a non-negotiable us and them, such that people will feel that they can never really or should never really lose an election, which allows me to add with your permission, a small footnote, given that this is so much on our mind right now, about the whole about the whole issue of what happens when right-wing populists in particular lose elections. I'm not saying that they always do this, but quite frequently, and of course right now, they will try to explain away what otherwise is sort of inexplicable. After all, when you think about it, if a representative tells you that they and only they truly represent the people, almost by definition, it cannot be the case that such a person loses an election or doesn't get an overwhelming majority at the polls. So a populist who raises this expectation has a pretty significant problem if they don't do well at the ballot box. Now frequently, again, I, I'm not saying always, but frequently, the strategy which they adopt in response goes something like this. They tend to suggest that we should take another look at that famous or perhaps infamous expression, the silent majority. By definition, if the majority isn't silent, populists will always already be in power. The fact that they didn't win the election only goes to show that something or somebody prevented the majority from truly expressing itself. So rather than talking about a silent majority, populists will suggest that we are dealing with a silenced majority. In other words, there is immediately the suggestion that something or somebody must have been manipulating things behind the scenes. And that's of course exactly what we're witnessing right now uh, play out in a very open, uh, very brutal, you might say, uh, fashion. But we've seen it with a number of right-wing populists in other parts of the globe, of the globe as well. Note, at the risk of saying the obvious, note how even if these figures ultimately concede, or if they actually never get to power in the first place in some countries, there is a certain damage to democracy because these leaders will constantly insinuate that you can't trust the electoral system, that there is something fundamentally rotten about our institutions and so on and so forth. They will show a kind of systematic distrust and systematically also encourage conspiracy theories. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that one isn't allowed to criticize the electoral system or the way campaign finance works in certain countries, especially but not only the US. There's a hell of a lot to criticize, obviously. But there's a difference between somebody who criticizes these issues in a relatively abstract and impersonal way with arguments which in theory everybody could follow. There's a difference between that and somebody who in essence tells us, because I didn't win the election or we didn't win the election, our system must be rotten. 
The former is a democratic stance. The second one, I submit to you, is a non-democratic and in many ways dangerous stance. All right, let me close this first chapter and swiftly move on to the second one of my, of my lecture and try to say something more broadly about the place, but also to some degree the undeniable success of right-wing populist strategies in 21st century politics. I think one of the most problematic tendencies among pundits, but also politicians, has been to, in one way or another, think and say that the de facto success of right-wing populists reveals to us something objective about certain problems, but also certain preferences of citizens in our democratic societies. That very often we've seen a tendency for, let's say liberals in the widest sense of that term, to go from one extreme where they say, oh, populists are all demagogues and they're irresponsible and they're always lying and it's all post-truth, to go from that extreme to another one where they say, oh, if so-and-so won the election, that shows that there is a particular kind of discontent. And of course, one of the most typical things to say in this context has been that these right-wing populists in particular showed us a kind of discontent among what stereotypically then is called the white working class, as if there were no non-white working class, just as a, as, a, as, a side, as a side remark. Now, obviously, I'm not saying that right-wing populists are making everything up or that there isn't a there there, but one of the most fundamental lessons of political science, and one that really goes back quite a long way, seems to be one that we are in danger of forgetting. What I'm talking about is the fact that conflicts in a society are not somehow objectively given. That political leaders, parties, and to some degree also the media, have a choice in how they describe and how they set up conflicts. Especially with political parties, you might say this is actually one of their primary functions. That contrary to those who think that democracy is purely about consensus, it's perfectly fine to have conflicts. Question is, how exactly do parties stage the battle? Where do they draw the lines of conflicts? What kinds of appeals do they make to potential followers? And the problem with right-wing populists, this goes back to the thing I was, I was briefly mentioning at the very beginning, is that they set up conflicts in such a way that they cross what I would take to be two hard borders of democratic conflict. You can have plenty of debates about, let's say, immigration and refugee policy in a democracy. And plenty of people are gonna say things which probably many people in the audience tonight wouldn't like and that I wouldn't like. But it would be hard for me to say that some of these policy positions let's say somebody who wants per se fewer immigrants is in and of itself necessarily undemocratic. That's different from right-wing populist parties and leaders who precisely perform the kind of maneuver I was talking about in my first chapter. The systematic attempt to deny the standing of certain citizens, the systematic attempt, let's call a spade a spade, to incite hatred against what are usually already vulnerable minorities. That's of course what Trump did more or less all the time. People got the message. They knew what he was for the most part talking about. And as we also saw over the past four years, it had a real effect on the ground. It led to what the philosopher Kate Mann at one point called trickle down aggression. If you look at the numbers of people who've been assaulted, um, Latinos, but also Asian Americans during the time of the, of the pandemic, uh, if you also look at levels of anti-Semitism, it's pretty clear that this kind of systematic denial of standing of certain citizens, the systematic way of saying some don't truly belong, this systematic crossing of this hard border of democracy had an effect on, on the ground. So this, I think, should tell us something about what in particular is wrong 
with right-wing populism, but it doesn't quite answer the question of why some of these strategies have been so successful. One reason I submit to you is that the way that some right-wing populists have presented the lines of conflict, the cleavages in contemporary societies, have been so successful, partly because their nominal opponents have also adopted them and have basically bought into certain stories about what happens today and therefore have made it much easier for some of the, when you think of it, think of it more generally, rather contradictory or not so obvious alliances that are at the heart of the electoral success of right-wing populism to really come together. Let me give you a concrete example of what I'm talking about. If you think, for instance, of a distinction of, in a sense, a description of a conflict that has been wildly successful, both in Europe and in other parts of the world, that basically comes down to telling us that the world in the 21st century, in Western democracies, is importantly divided between somewheres on the one hand and anywheres on the other. I'm referring, of course, to the distinction that, that the British intellectual David Goodhart uh, famously coined a couple of, couple of years ago, then many actors will start to orient themselves around precisely such an image of division. And they will also basically start to believe that yes, maybe right-wing populists are successful because they are looking out for the somewheres or the left behinds or however else you want to describe that, that category. Plus other parties will systematically start to refashion their own programs, refashion their own, if you like, representational offerings according to this mental map of the world. Now, with all due respect to, to David Goodhart, I think this distinction, as seductive as it has been for many people, also as, with all due respect, simplistic it has been for many people, is empirically, in many ways, simply flawed. I'll just mention two aspects. First, if you look at the elites that for the most part remain the decision-making elites, and with all due respect to all the academics who might be, who might be listening, academics are not the decision-making elites. I'm talking about people in the economy, in finance, in administration, in the judiciary, and so on. If you look at these sorts of elites, they remain thoroughly national. It's not true that these are anywheres who could just easily move around the world. Um, if some of my students said to me, look, you know, I'm, I'm highly, highly qualified. Uh, you know, I have great credentials from great universities. And tomorrow I want to go and join the French elite. I would say good luck. That's empirically not necessarily a very plausible uh, proposition. So elites in many ways remain very national. Of course, there are plenty of people who are also moving around, but to the extent that we are talking about, you know, well-off elites who do that, it simply doesn't follow that these sorts of figures will necessarily be terribly liberal, let alone be genuinely cosmopolitan in any strong normative sense of that expression. Yes, you know, you might, you might have a certain uh, appreciation for exotic food, you might, you might have a certain kind of a way of being in the world, which, you know, accurately reflects your frequent uh, flyer miles account, but a commitment to, let's say, global redistribution, a commitment to basically saying that all human beings stand in a similar moral relations to, relation to each other, that sort of truly substantive moral commitment, of course, for the most part, remains an exception, and if anything, is much more likely to be found among people who precisely are not well off, but who are very often forced to migrate as opposed to travel or migrate by choice. These are just a couple of relatively banal general, general empirical, empirical uh, 
um, objections, I simply, I simply mention them to complicate what in my view has proven to be a highly seductive, but at the same time highly simplistic description of a particular, particular conflict. One that also tends to foreground culture, one that also in a very perverse way actually tends to flatter liberal cosmopolitan elites because they will tend to think as academics, as journalists, etc., that, oh, well, you know, it's horrible that we forgot about the left behinds and the somewheres, but hey, it's still all about us. And if only we, you know, went on more, what in the US for a while used to be called Trump safaris and, you know, looked at the left behinds and found the most real, real Americans somewhere in a Midwestern diner, then everything would change. And in many ways, this is simply a, at best misleading, at worst pernicious understanding of some of the central conflicts and cleavages in our world, but one that has had real consequences because other actors, other than right-wing populists, that is to say, start to orient their programs around such understandings of conflict. So to put it very bluntly, uh, behind closed doors, you can imagine many leaders of social democratic parties effectively saying, oh, the success of right-wing populists have taught us that workers simply don't like foreigners and we're gonna have to start adapting to that supposed reality. If you look more careful empirically, carefully empirically, again, it's been shown over and over again that actually it's not true that lots and lots of workers are you know, rushing to join the far right. Lots and lots of workers don't vote at all. And what we should learn is not that, you know, they all hate foreigners, but that they feel that there is no real attractive offering for them, even among nominally social democratic parties with certain, with certain exceptions. So I think this, this sense of having lost a real grip on how we should describe and understand certain conflicts, the tendency to basically play into the hands of right-wing populists, partially at least explains why what in many ways is a rather heterogeneous, which is a polite way of saying in Congress, alliance has been so successful in at least a number of, in a number of countries. What I'm talking about is what some of our colleagues in, in political science, I think have rightly called plutocratic populism. If you look at the US, for instance, the really quite strange alliance between figures who push economic policies, which are actually wildly unpopular with a very clear majority of Americans, the kind of economic policies which always come down to deregulation and tax cuts for you know, the, upper, the upper 1%, the alliance of those people with figures who basically have made it their business model to push culture war, to essentially use culture war, also to distract from these ultimately very unattractive economic policies. Similar, a similar alliance between, if I may put it bluntly, bigotry on the one hand and big business on the other, I think is also behind the particular strategy that Modi and the BJP have been pushing in India. That rather dark sort of diagnosis uh, is one on which I'll finish my very quick, very crude, I admit, second chapter. I want to move on in the last part of my, of my remarks to something which, as I tried to hint at the beginning, I think gets relatively little attention. Obviously, a lot has been said of how different policies might have to be fashioned in response to right-wing populism, how in particular left-wing parties might basically take a, take a take quite different stance, uh, perhaps position themselves more clearly against something that we might crudely call neoliberalism. All these debates obviously have been very prominent and have been very important. I think there is something somewhat more fundamental going on which at least has to some degree facilitated the rise of right-wing populism. It's by no means the cause, it hasn't determined it, but since in any case, there is no single macro cause, which we, I think we could plausibly identify as you know, the singular thing that is responsible for right-wing populism, um, I think it's at least somewhat important to highlight these relatively neglected aspects. 
What am I talking about? I'm talking about what at least I see as a long process of decay as far as the critical infrastructure of representative democracy is concerned. What I mean by that is the following. I mean those institutions who pretty much ever since the 19th century were deemed to be essential to make representative democracy work properly. Political parties on the one hand and professional media on the other. Clearly, these institutions have undergone many, many profound structural transformations. And it's an absolute cliche to mention that they are undergoing a very important structural transformation at the moment as well. Obviously, in particular, professional, professional media. But whatever you think about these contemporary structural transformations, I think it's important to recognize a more long-term process of decay or deterioration, where we see these institutions no longer living up to what I would say are some very minimal but important normative standards for judging the health of these institutions. And I just want to mention two or three of these minimal normative expectations. And I hope that by the end, you will see how all this relates back to right-wing populism. What I also hope is that you will see that some of the important normative but empirical work that needs to be done today when we tackle some process of repairing democracies needs to start there, in addition to rethinking policy questions. So what do I mean by these minimal normative expectations? One very important one that applies to parties in particular but to some degree also to professional media, is a requirement, a basic requirement of pluralism. Some constitutions in Western democracies actually make this mandatory. They say that a political party cannot be run in an autocratic fashion. Spain and Germany are examples of this. Clearly one can overdo this kind of thing. If you read, for instance, the German party law, there are incredibly detailed prescriptions of how often you have to have meetings and so on and so forth. Clearly, reasonable people can disagree about what internal pluralism, internal democracy in a party means. But the intuition behind provisions, including constitutional provisions like this, I think is a plausible one. It's, that a, it's, it's the fear that a party that is run in an authoritarian way on the inside is also likely to be somewhat autocratic, somewhat authoritarian on the outside, and in particular when it comes to power. Viewed against that background, it might give us pause that so many right-wing populist parties today are precisely autocratic in certain ways. Extreme examples would be Gert Wilders' uh, Freedom Party in the Netherlands, as some of you, as some of you may remember, uh, that party only has literally two members. One happens to be Gert Wilders himself, and the other one happens to be a foundation of which you'll be surprised to hear, Gert Wilders is the only member. Or maybe closer to home in Oxford, uh, the Brexit party advertises itself as a people's party, with more than 100,000 supporters, which sounds great. Except when you look more closely, it turns out that actually the Brexit party is of course a limited liability company. And if you then go to company's house and look up the details of what's actually going on, you realize that there's only one so-called person of significance who really controls things. And you'll be massively surprised that this person happens to be Nigel Farage. Now, I don't want to overplay this, overplay this, overplay this point. Um, obviously, people join parties not because they believe in something called pluralism in general. Uh, they're not relativists. They are, after all, partisans. They commit to particular partisan principles. But the important insight is that no partisan principle is ever going to magically and automatically implement itself. You still need to debate 
what freedom means for you if you happen to be in favor of the Freedom Party, what equality means if you happen to be a certain kind of socialist. Nothing obviously directly follows from this that couldn't go through a meaningful, a meaningful uh, set, of, set of internal pluralistic debates. And if those sorts of things happen, I think it also becomes much more likely that partisans, while remaining partisans, while remaining committed to a particular program, get used to the notion that the other side in, a, in an internal conflict could possibly be right, even if they happen to find themselves on the losing, on the losing side. And not least, those who experience that kind of internal democracy might also be much more willing to stay inside what I earlier on described as one of the hard borders of democratic discourse. Secondly, and just briefly, I think another important minimum requirement is that political parties are transparent and related to that, autonomous. We've seen plenty of parties, especially in recent decades, which essentially were sort of front organizations or vehicles for something else. Famous or infamous example in our era, you might say, is Berlusconi's Forza Italia, which was really a sort of mixture of a media company, a football fan club, and a kind of personality, personality cult, such that certainly internal processes of pluralistic debate couldn't possibly, couldn't possibly happen. Uh, there was also, in a sense, no real program beyond the man, the man himself, and behind the man himself, also his particular, his particular economic, economic interests. Against that background, also, it should be a deeply worrying thing if a party basically gives up on the whole business of producing policy or producing even programmatic statements. Think back to something very peculiar that happened just this past summer when the Republican Party in the US at, at the time of the convention essentially said, we're not issuing a new program. We are basically just pledging fealty to the president and whatever he wants, we will, we will want. That's a deeply worrying sign about a particular party, but especially in the two party system about the health of democracy more broadly. A good, a well functioning party will generate something like a legitimate opposition also on the inside. And if you simply say we're de facto something like a personality cult, it's very hard to see how you could possibly, how you could possibly do that. Now, I will not go into any more details about transparency and autonomy, especially again in the context of the US. There's a hell of a lot to be said about dark money, about the fact that in many, many cases, and this obviously doesn't just apply to Republicans, also applies to Democrats in a meaningful way, um, what actually happens with parties, how party politics is financed has become very obscured, has become very difficult for citizens to understand and also very difficult for citizens often to participate in. What I would simply say more broadly is that I would agree with, I think, an important insight by Onora O'Neill, who at one point said that especially the media, but actually also political parties, should not just be accessible to citizens, they should also be accessible to citizens. People should understand where they're really coming from, how they work, who finances them, and so on and so forth. And that set of expectations, broadly speaking, I think also applies to professional media. If some of you like, we can talk more about the media in particular, in particular later on. Uh, there's a lot to be said about that as, as well, of course. My point for now is simply that the decay of this kind of critical infrastructure of democracy, the decay of political parties, the fact that some of them have become like internal autocracies, that some of them have become like vehicles for more or less hidden interests, that a similar story to some degree can be told about the media, that this systematic decay has facilitated, but again, not determined the rise of right-wing populism in all kinds of important ways. So I want to leave it at that for now.
I simply want to underline uh, something which uh, is a wildly, wildly unexpected conclusion from a professor, namely that things are much, much more complicated than they're often made out to be when, for instance, now people simply say, oh, but look, hasn't it just been proven again that 70 plus million Americans are fully on board with right-wing populism, they were willing to re-elect Trump. Doesn't that reveal to us the objective reality of politics in the, in the, 21st, in the 21st century? Just as if all these citizens were completely disconnected from the broader critical infrastructure of democracy, just as if it didn't play a role, how other actors, including other political actors, pundits, media, other citizens, understand where we are in 21st century democratic politics. My plea, and I'll really finish with that, is to pay more attention to these intermediary institutions, which I was talking about at the very end. This is, in my view, the most neglected aspect of all the anxieties, all the agonizing about the fate of democracies in the 21st century so far. I'm not saying that many of the other issues, rising inequality, rising xenophobia, don't matter. Of course, they do matter. But none of these challenges will ever present themselves to us in a kind of unmediated, seemingly objective way. They will always be mediated through institutions like parties, like the media, and so on. And we should worry somewhat more about the health of these institutions while we also worry about the actual policy challenges to democracies in the 21st century. Thank you for your attention, and I look forward to a hopefully controversial discussion from now onwards. Thank you very much, Professor Muller. That was really fantastic, incredibly clear, and uh, very, very thoughtful and uh, original.